right, well, to be respectful of time, I'm going to keep one eye on the waiting room. Um, I'm Greg oh, Wallace sorry. from Studio B, and I just want to welcome everybody today. And I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day um, to sit in and listen to this presentation, which, it, which is intended to be uh, interactive. So, um, and that presentation is How Does Stress Express? And today you are going to be led by uh, Tushar Bhagat. Uh, he's an accomplished biomedical scientist and a commended medical student, medical school faculty member. Dr. Bagat teaches MBSR, which is mindfulness-based stress reduction and other stress reduction programs to his colleagues. Aside from doing translational cancer research, he is pursuing research on mindfulness-based well-being programs for professionals. He firmly believes that the potential of science-based mindfulness practices in reducing stress and increasing well-being. Uh, so, so today's session is going to be recorded and we will be sending it out to the group and to the individuals that were not able to join us. Uh, that will also be accompanied by some resources um, just to follow up on, on what you're um, going to experience today. We are here for any questions. We do intend to stay on for a few minutes after the session. So if you have any questions, uh, whatsoever, please, you're welcome to stay on and, and address. And I am in the chat if you have any uh, technical questions or concerns. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Tushar. Thank you, Gretchen, for that very kind introduction. And thank you for being here to support this particular workshop. And I want to welcome you all. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to you for making the time not only for yourself, but for everyone who's here. I imagine it was just like you and me, two people would not work, right? Um, so thank you all for joining. So I would, I'd like to begin with a couple of logistical things that might help you along the way today. If you have any technical difficulties, you can uh, reach out. Gretchen will be there uh, standing by to help you with anything. And you can do so by typing in the chat box um, and directly messaging Gretchen. So she gets it, yeah, and not everyone else. Uh, the other thing is, I see many of you have your names on the screen. That's very helpful uh, to see that there are all these people populated here. But some of you have uh, some acronyms. If you'd like to rename yourself just with your first name, if you want to keep your identity confidential, you can just go by a first name. And to be supportive of diversity, it might be helpful to maybe add your pronoun if you feel comfortable adding that um, to make the space more inclusive and safe for everyone, yeah? So having said that, um, I would like to bring something to you. I would like to uh, introduce a few concepts while engaging you in it. So bear with me as I share this with you. So in, uh, my intention, uh, let me convey that to you first. So I'm here to uh, conduct this workshop, but my intention in con uh, conducting this workshop is to <clears throat> accomplish a couple of things in this process. One, I'd like to convey the way uh, we interact with stress and the way it affects us. And what are the things that could be in our hands and what are the things that are <clears throat> probably more challenging for us to manage? And through that, my central intention is to uh, leave you with, when you go away from the seminar, to leave you with a few ideas and thoughts that could potentially give you uh, some inspiration, motivation, and actual practical tools to directly implement in your personal and professional life so that you have slightly more resilience in you <clears throat> to manage whatever there is to manage uh, in your life. Yeah, and we are going to do this in a, in a, in a structured, organized fashion. <clears throat> and my goal is to present to you some direct experience of people, how they relate to stress, and then connect that <clears throat> to the science or the neuroscience of, of stress. How does it look like when you are stressed? And how would it look like when that is changed? So in this three-part series, we are going to touch upon the the whole picture of stress and how the mutual interaction of stress and our body works for us. So to start with, uh, 
let's open this practice. <clears throat> let's open this session by checking in with yourself. And when I say checking in with yourself, you know, we, we locate ourselves on the map. So similarly, you locate yourself within your own map of existence. And how does that look like? It looks like you're checking in that what are you thinking right now? Is there curiosity? Is there some uh, nervousness, anxiety, restlessness, perhaps you're feeling calm, perhaps certain way you're feeling emotionally. You don't know how, there may be a word for it, there may not be. Or perhaps your body is uh, sensing some tiredness or some pain, some strain, or even feeling relaxed. So I invite you to check in with yourself and you could do so by either closing your eyes and really, really sitting comfortably in a way that allows you to sit in upright and dignified posture. Yeah, to so see what feels more uh, calling to your body, closing your eyes. And if you choose to leave them half open, maintaining a lower gaze, looking one feet beyond your body. So just dwelling in this brief exploration. And while you do that, maybe taking some help from the sound that you will hear from this bell. Just focusing on that sound and then bringing your attention to capture what may be present for you. As if you're ready, switching your attention from the sound to what is seen, what is present within you right now. And seeing if you can come up with a word or a phrase to describe this. It could range anywhere from feeling drowsy, feeling lethargic, feeling energized, or feeling blah, I don't know what word to use. Even that is an option, but getting in touch with yourself. And if you feel comfortable sharing that, I invite you to type a word or even a phrase or sentence in the chat box to share what is present for you. And when you read these shares in the chat box, seeing if this has happened to you before, or perhaps that is something new to you. And all types of shares are welcome, ranging from calm to anxious, exasperated, stressed out, whatever feels safe and comfortable to you. And practicing non-judgment towards your own self and towards others as you read this. It's completely normal to feel anxious and tensed and restless with all that may be going on in a day-to-day -day life, even including feeling calm and sometimes unfocused. So bringing acceptance to whatever you feel within you and whatever you are reading from uh, what people are sharing. It allows us to kind of give us a sense of solidarity that and common human experience that we share and letting us know that we are not alone in that. Yeah. So continuing to share what is here for you. And then we dwell into another reflection. And you can reflect on this uh, with closed eyes or open eyes, really allowing yourself to focus on this. So what we are going to do uh, is think of a stressful event. It could be from today, it could be from the last week, or it could be a long-standing experience. You, it still stays with you. 
But what I would suggest is to choose something uh, on a scale of one to 10, maybe of an intensity of maybe six, maybe seven, but not choosing something very intense that might bring up things or trigger you, yeah? So choosing one such event, it could be a conversation with a close family member, with a colleague, or with customer care service. It could be with anyone. It could be something you read that has brought up a lot of emotion and thought process in you, and that brings up stress in you. Really being intentional and clear on what you choose. And at least for the duration of this practice, for this session, bringing your openness, curiosity, sense of exploration, even if skepticism, but openness, engaging with these practices for this duration. And then when you come away from that and then reflecting how that was for you. But for now, being open and engaging. Once you have identified this stressful interaction event in your life, either thinking if you can remember uh, what thoughts were running through your head. Maybe some thoughts are running through your head right now. Does it make, did it make you feel a certain way emotionally? If you can recollect, maybe even now. Do you have any memory of something that was happening in your body or maybe it is happening now, whether there is tightness somewhere, there's some tension that may be felt if it is. Really exploring. Taking another moment or two to identify, to recognize, and continuing to remember to not judge, just to look at it as an observer. And once you have identified, seeing if you feel comfortable and safe to share uh, what was present in you, perhaps in smaller groups. And there are guidelines for this sharing. Uh, and there's a purpose for the sharing. Sharing is a very uh, central part of integrating mindfulness in your life. Yeah. So I'm going to type these uh, guidelines in the chat box. So when you go into the breakout rooms, um, of sharing, you'll still have access to these guidelines. And I'm, I'm going to uh, very quickly clarify some of these for you. So in order to create a safe container for people to feel comfortable sharing and connecting, not only with themselves, but others, uh, practicing speaking from your direct experience, uh, refraining from giving any advice, so how that looks like is speaking from I, not you. Like, oh, you know, when you do this, avoiding that language, yeah? Also avoiding any crosstalk, not talking in response to what someone has shared, keeping it to your own independent share. And in this particular process, also using it as a mindful process, what it looks like is really checking in with your body when you're deciding to share, focusing on what you're saying, what you'd like people to hear. As a listener, really giving space, your full attention to whoever has decided to be vulnerable with you and to share with you, yeah? Um, and the guiding points for you, the points to converse or talk about would be 
the stressful event that you reflected on, discussing about what happened in that stressful event, not logistically in detail, the storyline, what, what happened with you? What type of thoughts were running through your head? Did you notice any, anything in your body, your heart racing, your breathing is fast, a tightness anywhere in the body? Any emotions that you can remember that came up then or even as its memory is with you right now? Talking about that, hiding any identities of people, not using any names of people. If the people that, that you're talking about seem to be the ones you may have worked with or do work with, yeah, maintaining confidentiality. So in a moment, Gretchen will uh, create these uh, breakout rooms for, for you. But I really invite you to engage because this process really brings up certain things, certain learnings, not only for you, but for others. There is a purpose for this process. I will briefly, we'll very quickly discuss that as you come out and rejoin with the larger group. So Gretchen, when are you ready to assign them? Great, right, I'm gonna open all the rooms now. Mm -hmm. And during this time, if you encounter any difficulty, there's always a button in the breakout room to ask for help, yeah? And we'll be on standby to help you. So ideally, we'd like to have three to four people in each yes. room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four is a magic number, but then it's possible with the even or odd number, it could be one more or one less and maybe one or more groups. And we roughly will have about five to seven minutes. So each person will have maybe a minute or two to share. Yeah. So being respectful of time. Oh, I see. I think I'm supposed to be assigning them and gotcha. I apologize for that. It seems like it's working. There might be a faster way to do this. I just don't know. Hmm. All right, almost there, a few more to go.
I think I put five in one on accident. I think everyone is in. Okay. And let's keep track of time. So we're going to bring them back around. Uh, I think they just got started. So maybe in another six minutes, we give them a two minutes, uh, let's say, heads up. Right. They'll be definitely back by then. Uh, we have somebody just joining. Oh, yeah, they might have gotten kicked out. So, Kate, do you have any difficulty joining the small groups? If you are able to hear us. I'm able to hear you. Sorry, I just got out of another meeting. I'm joining now. Oh, I see. Okay. So if you're just joining uh, in the chat box, there are guidelines to use to discuss in the small group session, where you're basically discussing about a difficult interaction you had and what do you recall in terms of how it landed with you, how you felt in your body, what were the thoughts that were running through your head, and did it make you feel a certain way emotionally? Now, again, without identifying any names or describing the whole story, but talking about you. If you feel comfortable joining and sharing that, please do. But you can also be in a listener's role when people are sharing. So Gretchen, maybe you can assign Kate to one of the rooms. Yes. Again. There you go, Kate. We're, we'll send you to a room just for a few minutes and then we'll come back as a group. Okay, okay. thanks. All right, that worked. Okay, so these breakout rooms, so I know there are a lot of people. It takes a while to arrange that. Um, the other way, I don't know what, which way, there are multiple ways of doing this. I don't know which way you're using, but the, the way I do it is I let the breakout rooms assign automatically. So there are already people everywhere. The moment I hit the main button, then they all accept at once, yeah? But gotcha. before they, I allow allow them to accept that, I go through the list to do this rearranging, like for a minute. I uh, I, I thought I did that, and for some reason, and then when it came up, it yeah. you know nobody was anywhere. So oh, yeah. <laughs> Zoom surprises <laughs> you, <laughs> right? So maybe in settings, I I didn't uh, click something there. Hmm. Well, it's an evolving process. Yes, it is. Thank you, though, for your patience. Oh. oh, by the way, now that we are just two of us, do you get any info on uh, Intel on the hierarchy or who's working with who or do we need to be sensitive to that? I don't have, um, I okay. don't have any information on that. All right. I think when people meet each other for one time, then they meet them again, the comfort level keeps growing. So I hope they do this on a regular basis um, in some form. So do you want me to screenshot who are in these groups? That would be very helpful. You might need to take like four or five screenshots, but okay. this will be very useful for the next time. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. And, and then. Uh, oh, you have the ability to text them the message on the breakout rooms, but I don't seem to have that. So if you can just say, please uh, refer to the guidelines for your sharing. Okay. It's okay if people even chit chat in this session. The main objective is to have them connect with each other. Please refer to guide in chat. Um, The first time people are hesitant. Right. Very hesitant. They don't want to type. They don't want to show their face. It's true. They so don't... how long do how much how long do they have in here? So uh, I think it's it's three or four minutes so far. So we'll leave them another three minutes to come back. Because too much time also makes people feel like what do we talk about if not many people are talking, if only one right. or two are. Yeah. Yeah, so about 1.30, we'll bring them all back. So the rest of the thing will still take a lot of time. 
So the extra 15 minutes, I'll leave them for more um, dialogue or question and answers and comments and such. But for the one hour, I'll focus on the content for today. So I didn't count, there are roughly about 50 people, 40, 50. Yeah, about 50 people. Hmm. That's a very good turnaround given the size of that place. Yeah, I agree. I'm pleased with this. Yeah, yeah. In some other schools that we did this, and like um, there, there are maybe 1,000, 1,200 employees, and then there were maybe 30, 20. So, in reference to the size, the turnaround was just modest, but this is quite, quite high. Yeah, I agree. We did good advertising that shows. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paige is back. All right, so why don't we Seems close? like they had enough, they had, they're done with their discussion. So welcome back Paige and R. Kudgus, if I'm saying your name correctly, and Chuck. Yes, we weren't sure whether we were supposed to stay or go. <laughs> uh, you had, you had stay. I wonder if you were able to see Gretchen's message that you had three more minutes. I did not. Uh, hmm. Okay, so we'll see what is happening with that. Yeah, it's saying that the breakout rooms are all going to rejoin with us in, um, there's a countdown, 30 seconds. So everybody will be back with us in just a few moments. Yeah, yeah, in another minute, everybody will be back. You're back in time. So whether you were able to share something or speak or be a listener, I hope um, you found some solidarity in terms of how people experience their difficult interactions. <laughs> I think this is oh, a moment. Oh. oh, hi, Jessica. All right, seems like everyone is back. Uh, welcome back, everyone. It's very nice to see a lot of faces. Uh, if you do feel comfortable turning your video on, I invite you to do so. It kind of replicates the in-person in uh, workshop when you're able to see people, uh, their expressions, their voices, and so on. So to continue further, uh, I hope you got a chance to hear someone or share with someone, yeah? So now what, are, what, are we, what we are going to do now is uh, interact with the rest of the group because neither me or Gretchen or the rest of the smaller groups uh, got to hear what you talked about. And that might be really valuable experience to share with the rest of the group. So if you feel comfortable sharing what you shared in the smaller group, uh, you, you are welcome to either raise your physical hand if your video is on, or you can also use the electronic hand that could be found at the bottom of your Zoom, either under reactions, the raise hand function, or it could be found on the top left of your Zoom taskbar under view, uh, a raise hand. It could also be right below your participant window. So if you click participants and uh, there will be buttons there to raise hands. If you do not find the raise hand function, um, you can type in the chat box and say, I need to find that out. Or the last, um, let's say last resort, you can just unmute and start talking. So to repeat the question, um, when you are reflecting on this difficult interaction, difficult event in life, do you recall how was your response to that? What were you thinking? Did you feel a certain way emotionally? Did your body uh, feel a certain way that you can remember? This is the first session. So there's some some uh, hesitation, some resistance, some maybe anxiety. Uh, however, this process really allows people to know that you're not alone. And then we are going to connect this process with what we are going to learn today and in rest of the session. So it has a vital role in this whole three series uh, workshop that we are having. Uh, you can also, you're also welcome to type in the chat box if that is a comfortable mode or of sharing for you. And to really and ensure your trust, 
Um, this is all going to be confidential, what you share. Yeah, it's not, and uh, nobody's going to repeat it outside of this group. So how does difficult interaction and stress show up in you? I think I saw one hand, oh, okay. Yeah, so while the rest of you are contemplating, we can begin with- uh, There's a couple hands up too, Sean. Yeah, yeah, there's Anjanelle and uh, you, sir. So we'll begin with Anjanelle. So Anjanelle, when you're ready, you can unmute and uh, share what you have to say. Sure, um, so this is, uh, it was kind of interesting when I said it out loud um, because mm -hmm. I didn't realize that this is a very common thing, but um, in the stressful event that I was thinking of, I ended up being hungry all the time. Um, and this is something that someone else in my group also uh, had a similar reaction to for her event. Um, and my thought process around it was that um, I, I couldn't really control the situation that was making me feel stressed. And so I kind of um, like made that control in the shape of me being able to eat what I wanted. <laughs> so it's, it's a different kind of physical reaction than like back pain or neck pain or something. Um, but it was something that was really, uh, that stood out to me. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that. And you know, when rest of you are listening to this, thinking about how many of us feel that way or how many of us experience like being hungry or hangry, like you call it sometimes, yeah? So knowing that Anjanelle is not alone in this, and I was curious about uh, how it showed up for you, Anjanelle, when you were like struggling with hunger, what was happening that you can articulate in words, maybe something you felt in the body or how you're feeling? Um, so it was usually when I wasn't hungry at all. And I think it was just me looking for something to do to kind of occupy my mind um, instead of thinking about the stressful event. So it allowed me to get up and do something else and focus on what I wanted to eat instead of worrying about that thing. Mm. Yeah, stepping, stepping away from a st stressful task, grabbing a pint of ice cream, bag of chips, snacks, anybody? Yeah, does that sound familiar? And there are several other things. We'll keep exploring this more in, in the second and the third session. Uh, but let's see. Thank you for sharing, Anjanelle. Let's, let's continue with uh, you, sir. I saw their hand up. If you're there, you can yep. unmute and share. Um, something that I shared in our group was I actually don't feel anything at all. I kind of stop feeling. I kind of go numb, actually. And I, I kind of go on like an autopilot mode. So to the outside world, it seems like everything's fine. I'm functioning. I'm doing the tasks I need to do. I'm showing up for work or school in the past, um, doing my duties, but deep down I'm suffering. And then once everything passes, it kind of unfolds in, in an overwhelming sense. And so, yeah, I kind of like compartmentalize. And so I, I guess I just, I go numb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as difficult as this sounds like, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you, you spoke up and shared uh, you, sir. But then uh, how many of us like, are find ourselves in the situation where we are kind of suppressing something that is within us, what we heard you sir say that suffering. Yeah, how many of us do that? and still go on with life, doing all the things we need to do, do our work, take care of family, yourself, kids, whatnot. Uh, but then there's something that is unaddressed. So I was curious about uh, what, do you, what do you mean by this suffering when you say that, you sir, if you feel like sharing that. I mean, it just feels like I, I merely exist mm -hmm. in those moments. Like I'm not living life. Mm -hmm. I'm just existing, uh, almost robot-like, um, mm -hmm. very anxious, very depressed, but mm -hmm. it's almost like I just don't have time. There's no time to deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I think. That sounds challenging. And uh this feeling of, I don't really exist. I don't have time for myself. 
uh, what Brene Brown, uh, the professor at University of Texas, uh, she says, not having the white space that she protects, just time for yourself to just be, uh, that's a whole another topic that will take maybe two hours to dwell in, but it's a concept that is coming up, uh, what you shared about you, sir. I saw one more hand up. If you remember who you were, would you like to share what came up for you? Or even as a result of what you heard from uh, Anjanelle and you, sir, what comes up for you that, hmm, this sounds like something new or, oh, it doesn't happen to me. Oh yes, it happens to me also in a different way. That might really help people hear what you have to say. So let's, uh, I think I see Jessica's hand up. So let's go with Jessica while the rest yeah. of you are listening and contemplating to share. Um, so I shared that I'm having some uh, a stress around making a decision, uh, a school decision for my kids and that I have both, even thinking about it now, my heart is racing. Um, I have decision fatigue. I'm done making decisions um, for everyone in my life. And I, it's, I physically feel um, like I can't, <laughs> I can't make another hard call. Um, I'm really fearful of making the wrong choice. And I carry all of that sort of physically, I get headaches. Um, and it's just, um, and also the same sort of thing. It really also, I felt really strongly when you said, you said that it's just like shut down. I feel really just blocked sometimes by making these um, hard choices. And so, um, yeah, mm. fatigue and just like, I can't um, do another thing. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm so glad you shared that, Jessica. It's not an easy one to share, but then why do I have to make all these hard decisions over and over again? If I'm done with one, there's another one to do. There's another one to do. And then that taking up energy from you, so much energy that you feel so uh, deflated, de-energized. Does that sound familiar to anyone in life? Yeah, I believe everyone uh, makes decisions in life. Uh, when we have the physicians groups, they have their own sets of decisions to make that exhaust them and kind of drains them, burns them out, yeah? But we are going to see what is happening in our body when uh, this kind of decision fatigue happens. So you see there are different ways people are relating with stress and different ways it is affecting them, yeah? Uh, so this is really helpful when we hear people share. But you can continue to type in the chat box. We'll have time to share at the end, but I do want to connect what you shared and something more that I want to bring to you, yeah? So bear with me while I share this. So um, from whatever you have heard, or perhaps you're thinking about, oh, should I say this or not? No, it sounds too common. It sounds too silly. Thinking about all these stressful events or anything that you discussed in this cross, small group, uh, thinking of how the way stress is affecting us, whether individually you're thinking of things by yourself, self-judging, uh, being unkind to yourself, beating yourself for things, or whether that is uh, showing up as a result of uh, relationships that we may have, professional relationships, personal relationships uh, in our personal life and professional life. And also, uh, like we he heard some people say that it feels like so de-energized, the body is feeling that it does not have, it cannot do anything more. So there are these physiological effects on us that are happening, yeah? Um, and we heard from some people that they go on autopilot, they're just compartmentalizing and go on, they go on with their life. So some of these coping mechanisms. So one more question I wanted to throw out there for you is uh, any coping mechanisms that you're currently utilizing We'll be exploring this much more in detail uh, in the session too, but for now to bring that up, to connect with it, uh, let's maybe hear from a couple, couple people in terms of how do they cope with stress when they are stressed out? We heard that going automatically to food, not feeling hungry, but still going towards it. That is one of the coping mechanisms. What else do you do when you feel stressed out? 
So let's hear from Salil. I see his hand up. So Salil, you can unmute and speak when you're ready. So, I mean, like Anjanelle, I think I, I go towards food a lot. In fact, it's it's got a, it, it got really worse at the start of the pandemic, so much so that I just stopped bringing snacks home because I would just finish them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, another, another sort of way in which I try and cope with a lot of these things is uh, try and sort of focus on the more mundane things. So like instead of thinking, instead of thinking of the big picture, instead of thinking how this all fits into something else, try and focus on what, what can I get done in the next 30 minutes? Not necessarily sure that's healthy because my stress and my question mm -hmm. still remains unanswered, but at least in the short term, I can sort of get work done. It's not always very successful because eventually things come back. They don't always stay out. But that's that's sort of been my coping mechanism, either sort of eat something or just focus on what can I get done quickly and just have a checkbox that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, when you're hearing Salil say this, uh, have, you, have you done any, any such things to deal with stress? stress eating or making yourself focus on the task at hand to get things done. Still a coping mechanism that also can go into the realm of overworking or immersing yourself with work so as to not feel anything that is going on the way you're feeling, yeah? How many of us find ourselves in that situation? And like we heard Salil say, sometimes it works. So Salil, if you want to engage a little more, when you say sometimes it works, what happens the other times? Uh, the other times I simply then have, like it, it has happened that I simply cannot focus even on the task at hand. And at that point it's, it, it gets worse partially because I then will turn to other distractions. Like I'll just start playing a YouTube video or something that is utterly random, like something completely unrelated to work just to distract myself from it. Mm. And like th those things start happening when I'm not able to then even focus for that small amount of time, mm -hmm. which is bad because in my case, it then leads to after about 30 minutes of watching YouTube videos leads to the feeling that I just wasted 30 minutes of my life <laughs> doing the thing, which is not good. So mm. yeah, it's uh, all, all of that sort of feeds it. Yeah, yeah. Binge watching anyone? finishing the whole series in like one day or one weekend. Yeah. Anyone find themselves there. Yep. Yeah. Whether you say it or not, whether you, you can say it to yourself. Uh, so basically getting into the slippery slope of uh, coping mechanisms that are not really supporting you, but kind of sucking you in. So you can continue to share if you like, but I want to share some more things with you uh, on the same node. So I chose this image because it kind of represents in so many ways what I've heard time and again from the participants in the MBSR course uh, is people really feel the way this image looks like. They feel like frustrated, they feel tired and exhausted. Um, the posture of the person kind of conveys that with their hands holding their head. At the same time, the illuminated parts of their body, the joints, and some muscles, and particularly there's so much activity in the brain and the default mode network um, that are illuminated, that are not in a good state. So their body is feeling that, they are feeling that emotionally. Emotions are hard to show by pictures, but that is going on here too, yeah? So we heard some of the mechanisms, coping mechanisms that not really, they don't really help. Maybe help temporarily, but in the long term, they end up hurting ourselves. And a lot of the processing of the stress goes through our body. And I want to briefly show you uh, how that looks like. So the science of stress, if you will, the neuroscience of stress, and this is adapted from John Kabat-Zinn, the founder, creator of mindfulness-based stress reduction program at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Now the program has shifted to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. So imagining this is you, a person, going about their life. And we encounter these external stresses um, that are presented to us. They might show up in, a, in the form of some social stress, interpersonal stress. They could be stress that is coming up with churning, ruminating on thoughts. 
when this external stimuli happens, there's some perception that we have towards the stressful event and our body or mind appraises it. Then internal stress events, they start to begin. And these initially, they are meant to support us. When we are living in the wild, that they were helping us escape any wild animal trying to attack us. And how that was happening? By activation of cardiovascular system, mus musculoskeletal system, muscles are getting a lot of blood reaching to them. They are getting ready to either kick that uh, animal or to run away from it. Nervous system needs some activation for all these processes to engage, to protect us. But the immune system takes a toll during this process. There's a lot of inflammation in the body that is happening uh, as a result of this stressful event. Neurologically, the key uh, parts of the brain that are engaged in this, some parts called as hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenals, a lot of their function is to trigger the particular type of nervous system, particular branch of nervous system, and to produce these uh, stress hormones like cortisol in our body. Because uh, cortisol allows us to increase our heart rate, allows us to constrict our blood vessels. So the blood can reach to our extremities because we need to run away from this in inclement threat. Now we are no longer trying to escape a bear or a saber tooth tiger, but that bear saber tooth tiger is transformed into a human being now. We get the same reactions of fight, flight, or freeze, like we heard from some, some participants. Like I feel like I'm, I'm frozen, I'm stuck in a moment. That happens after this activation of the stress reaction. Now this event cascades into further increase in blood pressure because there's a lot of blood needed needing to be going to different parts of our body. So pulse rate obviously reflects that becoming high. Then the internalization of the, these stress events, psychological, physiological, or the, that happens, yeah. And further downstream effects of the stress, these stress events, they result into continual blood pressure increase uh, ir irregular heartbeats, arrhythmias. We will tend to lose, lose sleep due to certain stressful events in our life. We heard people talk about body aches, chronic headaches happen. Back aches, like the upper back, is known to be affected by stress. Even the lower back takes a toll. Around the shoulders, people feel stress. Maybe in their, uh, in their chest, in their belly. Anxiety is felt as a result of this. And we heard about uh, coping mechanisms from some people reaching out to food or overworking. So people are overworking. They become very hyperactive in whatever they do. They're kind of on an autopilot, really pumped up on adrenaline and cortisol that are released from the pituitary and the adrenal glands. Drugs, substances, alcohols. Uh, there are also a few other coping mechanisms that people reach out to. But ultimately what happens is like we heard from Salil and others is that these mechanisms don't always work. And worse yet, they lead to a breaking, breaking down point, a burnout point. And how does that show up? It shows up in the physical or physiological exhaustion like I think we heard from Jessica. Uh, and then we lose like passion for doing things, even like the things that made us happy, going for a hike, going for a walk in nature, even those, they don't feel so interesting, don't feel enthusiastic. So that leads to some, some level of depression that is seen, whether we understand that as depression or not, but it is present in varying degrees in people who are undergoing stress, engaging in maladaptive coping mechanisms. In my day job, I'm a molecular biologist, a cancer scientist. So we do get to look at inflammatory pathways certain genetic uh, alterations that happen in person. We study obviously this in the cancer context, but that is also applicable to people without cancer. Perhaps the 50% environmental effect on biological diseases are contributed by the environmental factors. So I know these pathways of, uh, that cause and contribute to cancer and heart disease among many other diseases, they get triggered due to the stress breakdown, yeah? So I wanted to take a pause at this point uh, as we still have maybe slightly more than five minutes to engage with you in terms of you, if you have any comments, if something came up as you heard whatever I shared with you, 
uh, something came up with you in the direct experience of you or something that was not clear so far. So today's session was geared towards understanding stress. Hearing directly from people that we have here, also connecting that with the physiology and neuroscience. And next time we'll get some more uh, chance, some more time to dwell deeper into this, yeah? So I would like to invite you to uh, really comment or share on your direct experience or anything that I have said so far. Again, you can raise your real hand, directly start unmuting and talking or raise your electronic hand. Also to remember, you can even type in the chat box if you have any question or comment. Um, so while waiting for others and while everybody else is listening, we can begin with uh, you, sir, when you're ready. I just wanted, I have another meeting coming up, so I have to go, oh. but I just wanted to say thank you. I really loved this. And I think it put a lot of perspective for me because I feel like sometimes I'm the only one struggling. Mm. And this was nice to know, especially with the past year, it makes, it almost looks like everyone's gotten used to it or mm. everyone's doing just fine. And I'm the only one that's not doing so fine, but um, mm -hmm. this is nice to talk to other people. So thank you. Thank you for being here for the time you could. And as you hear this from you, sir, does anyone feel like she's alone in feeling the way she does? Without, even if you don't say anything, you can use this technology to uh, show any reactions where in the reactions you can have thumbs up or any other emoji you can use to affirm you, sir, that she's not alone. Uh, many people feel what she feels, the way the stress is processed. We see some love and some thumbs up here, yes. So I hope to see you next time, you sir. You have to rush out, yeah. But the rest of us, we can continue our uh, exploration, investigation. Do you have any questions about today's session or even the upcoming ones? Because in the next one, we we are going to talk about uh, some more about how stress is processed, and we are going to focus more on the way resilience is translated in the mechanisms that we cope with, and perhaps also introduce some strategies. Uh, to address stress and to increase and strengthen our resilience. So anything else anyone would like to ask or comment on? In a moment of pause, we can just use this moment of pause of reflection to know that their heads are churning. They are thinking, they're hesitating, don't know if this is the right question or comment to make. Oh, maybe people already know about this, but you'd be surprised. One comment I was going to make, Tushar, is that I find personally uh, social media being an, an immediate distraction, but then mm -hmm. ultimately the cause of more stress, mm -hmm. uh, especially with uh, you know politics and everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, in the world now. And um, I have chosen to take a step away from that. And I mm -hmm. have found um, that to be an extremely positive <laughs> impact on my stress levels. Mm -hmm. This is a big one, Gretchen. I'm glad you brought up. And how many of us feel like after we have scrolled for like, say, five minutes, 10 minutes, and sometimes we might find ourselves, oh, it's an hour, I'm just scrolling. And what happens to your body after that? Do you feel like so excited and energized and then like ready to conquer the world or do you feel otherwise? Whether you admit it to anyone or not, whether you share it or not, sharing it to yourself, being honest to yourself, yeah? But if you feel brave um, to share it, you're welcome to do so. If anything resonated with you that you heard neuroscientifically, physiologically, um, and you know, I also, while you're thinking of whether to share or not, I also want to add uh, that oftentimes in a workplace, like I teach a lot of things in my workplace, people hesitate that. Will I look weak in front of people if I share something that is difficult for me? So it's almost like this alternate reality we live in at work to, sh to bring our best face while suffering underneath, like we heard from you, sir, earlier. Yeah. So, so at some point, what I found useful here at Einstein, Montefiore, in the health system I work in, people really felt like at home and relaxed and connected uh, when they were participating in such a program for like, they were there for eight weeks. 
but even for a brief period of time, there is some solidarity, the human commonality between people that they feel and slightly more ease because we spend so much more time at work, almost one third of our waking hours at work. It looks like Maybe. we have Danielle with a question or comment. Oh yes, Danielle, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah, this is actually just a comment on the um, social media and screen time. I, I will say that, um, so yeah, the long hours during, for, during the pandemic have been pretty um, hard on me personally for the, the amount of screen time um, in front of it with just more for health purposes, eye purposes, which also then causes more anxiety. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, I'll say though that around the holiday season, my husband and I made a um, I guess like a pact or just like a, a promise to ourselves, we were going to limit the amount of screen time, including TV, everything. And we did about five puzzles in a week or so and just spent that time with each other. And that was definitely freeing to totally walk away and not be in front of any sort of screen for and just, you know, take walks and stuff. And that was definitely a nice and needed break um, from everything. So that could be, haven't really been able to get back to that recently, but um, that is one way that it was uh, relieved stress for at least a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. You know, what Daniel shared also uh, adds an important point that how we can actually relate with the people we cohabit with, live with, and also help them support us and in, 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 uh, like in the process and of supporting them to make a deal that should we do puzzle instead, rather than individually scrolling each of our phones and hitting like or save with whatever we are looking at. Yeah. That is possible. Also, that brings up one more point in my head that when we were growing up, what were the other things that we were doing that we felt so much joy in relating with others as kids or teenagers or young adults? I mean, a lot of us are still young adults here. But reflecting on that, what other things were we doing besides uh, having so much screen time? So seeing if there's something you would like to share, but uh, while you're thinking about that, I do want to uh, remind us what we plan to uh, cover next time, which is exploring some more about the stress that uh, how it relates with us. And I would like to share maybe a, a scientific study or two. I tend to like uh, find a study for everything. I try to restrict myself today, but next time I do want to present some a clinical trial to you in terms of how certain coping mechanisms that we are going to discuss, they actually are working for different types of populations. Uh, and in the, in the process of these three sessions, what we are going to accomplish uh, is to find out how we can identify and use the essential blocks, building blocks of resilience, uh, and how we can build our competence in the process. We do have so many innate capacities and powers that we still are not aware of how to tap into them, identify them, and in the process build our confidence in, let's say, making decisions like we heard earlier that is difficult. To really understand that we cannot survive without getting help from other people and helping them. So we'll be learning that uh, and how integrity can be a resource in itself without being a burden and the service at the same time, how that can energize us. In the process, we'll end up finding out how to uh, conduct ourselves in the moment when we feel like we don't have control over things, yeah, like we are lost. So we'll get to discuss and explore a lot of these things in the next two sessions. So I just wanted to briefly uh, mention what's coming up as a cl cliffhanger for next time. So Gretchen and I will stay for a few more minutes. If you have any questions regarding what I shared today, what you heard today, including any questions you might have uh, in terms of what are the different ways Studio B can support you? What can you do when you like click there, go to the website, where to find what? What to use every day, once a week, maybe twice a day, what can be done? So Gretchen and I can answer those questions too. So we'll give it like another three to five minutes to stay over uh, if you have questions. And this could be done by chat too if you feel comfortable doing so without voice. But you're also welcome to uh, speak up with your voice or even have your video to converse and share. And if for those who have to go to their next commitment, it was wonderful to have you create this space for everyone and you. Thank you for joining. We look forward to seeing you next time. Yes, thank you everyone.
and we'll be sending out the recording of today's session uh, to revisit um, or to distribute to people that couldn't make it today. Thank you, Gretchen, for that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Laura, for being here.